Hello, I'm glad you're able to listen to this message. If you're not involved in a church somewhere, we'd love for you to join us some Sunday at Hope Fellowship for one of our three services. If not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area that teaches God's Word. I hope you enjoy the message. Lord, we come to you. We're glad we can meet like this. Uh, we, we recognize you for who you are, and we, we just want to tell you that you're worth everything to us. Those of here that, here that know you, we, we're glad we can spend this time with uh, your other folks that you've, you've chosen out of this world, and we're glad that we can tell you that you're important to us. We thank you. We, uh, we're grateful for what Jesus did. We understand that Lord Jesus, that you stepped into human history to, to demonstrate your great love for us. Thank you for taking our place in judgment and rising from the dead. I thank you that we can uh, <clears throat> sing these songs about what you've done and, and uh, who you are. I thank you for your word, Holy Spirit of God, that you've inspired for us. Uh, thank you that you are the one who guides us and, and leads us and teaches us. Uh, Lord, we uh, ask that you would take this word and bring it home to our hearts today as we take a closer look at it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, there was a, a married couple who had a quarrel. And as, as sometimes happens, you know, the silent treatment was given. You know, they, they vowed they weren't in, inside. The, I'm not going to speak first. I'm not going to speak first. Well, a week went by. And the husband had a trip coming up to Chicago that he needed to get up early for. And he was thinking, man, I'm not going to break the silence first. And so he decided he needed his wife's help to get him up. So he wrote on a piece of paper, please wake me up at 5 a.m. And he put that note right by where she went to sleep on her little stand there. Well, the next morning he gets up and he's like, what? She's already up. He looks at the clock real quick. It's 9 o'clock. And he's like, what the? He's about ready to say something. He looks over and on his little stand there, and there's a note there that says, wake up. It's 5 o'clock. So uh, <laughs> let me ask you this question. Do you speak up when it's necessary? Do you speak up when it's necessary? I was reminded of an uh, experiment that was done back in, uh, the, well, 1951 by a man of the name of Solomon Ash. And he did some experiment, he did some research on conformity. And uh, his experiment was, he had a card that had three different sized lines on the card, different lengths. The A line, the B line, the C line. They're obviously different lengths. And there was another card that uh, vary, varying lengths he would pick up and he would hold alongside of this card and he would ask the seven people who were there that would give verbal responses, uh, he would ask them which line that one matched on the card, A, B, or C. And obviously, there was an obvious match um, for, for anyone who's observant. And so, seven people would give their verbal answers, but six of those folks were actors, and one of the folks was the one being experimented on, right? So for the first couple of times, everyone verbally answered the correct answer. And then on the third, third try, generally on the third try, uh, they would answer something that was absolutely false. I and mean, it's obviously false, right? This line is definitely longer than that. And they would start giving the verbal responses that were false. And to a person, each one would say the same. And it got to the person who was, uh, who was being experimented on. You could see the look on their face. They're looking around like, are you nuts? But what would come out of their mouth would be the same thing that everyone else was saying. 75% of the time in this experiment, 75% of the time in this experiment, people would choose at least once to say the wrong answer, the obviously wrong answer, so that they could conform with the rest of the people in the room. 75% of the time. And, and so I ask, are, are you afraid to speak up about things that are true about your God? Um, Peter faced that, didn't he? Just to remind you, remember his epic failure uh, when, when uh, he was in the courtyard with the, of the high priest and Jesus was there, and you remember what he did? He conformed. Everyone there was a Jesus hater. 
And uh, as they were hating Jesus together, Peter knew it. They asked him if he knew him. And what? Three times he denied it. Why? That power to conform that, f that drove him to conform, he was afraid to speak up. Even though uh, a servant girl asked him one time, Someone is a non and uh, the most least intimidating person you want. A servant girl asked him, and he denied it. And so Peter was afraid to speak up at one point, but later we find something that's extremely interesting. That I'm going to read you a couple of passages here in the book of Acts where Peter does stand up in front of thousands of people. And so uh, let me read Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 47 as Peter the first time stands up in front of this huge crowd of people in Jerusalem, right where Jesus was crucified and, and, uh, and then uh, uh, resurrected. He said, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then a little further down in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And then another passage I'll read you of, of this boldness that Peter had in uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. Uh, this is after they healed uh, a beggar uh, who was uh, 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 familiar to everybody, and then they started to speak to the people, and they were basically arrested from the public square and taken aside and now are now facing the very same people that Jesus stood in front of uh, for his first trial. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, take note of this, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected and has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Notice the response. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could not see the man who had been healed standing there with them, uh, couldn't see the man, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked, everybody living in Jerusalem, so them knows they've done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it, but, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. And then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. 
But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. This is bold communication. This is the same Peter who was kind of trying to blend in with the rock wall in the, uh, in the high, uh, priest high, co uh, high priest court, uh, 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 courtyard, uh, where, where he was being questioned and afraid. Now he's standing up in front of thousands of people proclaiming this, unafraid. What's the difference is what I'm, what I'm going to focus on today. What's the difference? The Holy Spirit of God is the difference. The Holy Spirit of God is the difference. You see, Peter now has been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And what I want to do is I want to focus this morning on the, the Holy Spirit and his involvement in our life, enabling us to be bold like Peter in some, some circumstances. And so let's back up for a minute for the first point. The Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus to, uh, to his disciples. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit after he left. Look at John 14, verse 16. It says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither, it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. He promised the Holy Spirit to them that one after him would come. Now, you understand the true and living God is one. Uh, not, not one Jewish person would ever ever consent to believing that, that there is more than one God. But yet, still here we see clearly in the Bible the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being spoken of as God. Three distinct individual persons. The Father sent Christ who accomplished something that we could never do to save us. And Christ, along with the Father, sent the Holy Spirit when Jesus ascended into heaven. You see. And so, we find in Acts chapter Chapter 1, verse 4 through 8, is Jesus, as he's resurrected from the dead, before he ascends in the heaven, speaking to his followers. And here's what he says. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? There's a couple, couple of notes here. Um, baptism means to be placed into, or the Spirit of God would do the placing into Christ. You together with the Holy Spirit. He would dwell in people and change them. Notice one thing here. I, I want to point this out to you. They said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This is a total side note. But uh, they clearly expected Jesus to come back and reign on the earth, on the throne that he had promised David. That's a clear expectation of the apostles. And, and uh, they spent all this time with Jesus, and that was never, never something that Jesus corrected them on. And even here he doesn't correct them on it. He is going to return, and he's going to reign in this world and make everything the way it should have been. And so we find uh, Jesus not correcting them, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. He said, I'm just not going to tell you when. But it's coming. And so he goes on and he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What would happen when the Holy Spirit would indwell people who believe in him? They would have a new power. There would be something that would embolden them to live in the way that God wants them to live. And not to shrink back. There's a spirit in us now, if you're a follower of Christ, that beckons you to be bold. Beckons you to speak out when the right time comes. You see, even though at times we want to shrink back, we know it's our calling to speak out, you see, when the time comes. And so... The Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus. 
Number two here, the Holy Spirit has been given to all of God's people. All of God's people. Let me read this to you. This, uh, this was from uh, uh, John Ortberg. He, he, he wrote this. He said, Many years ago I was walking in Newport Beach, a beach in Southern California with two friends. Two of us were on staff together at a church, and one was an elder at the same church. And we walked past a bar where a fight had been going on inside. The fight had spilled out under the street, just like an old western. Several guys were beating up on another guy, and he was bleeding from the forehead. Well, we knew we had to do something, so we went over to break up the fight. And I don't think we were very intimidating. All we did was walk over and say, Hey, you guys, cut that out. It didn't do much good. And then all of a sudden, they looked at us with fear in their eyes. Now, the guys who had been beaten up on the guy stopped and started to slink away. I didn't know why until we turned around and looked behind us. And out of the bar had come the biggest man I think I'd ever seen. He was something like six feet, seven inches, maybe 300 pounds, maybe 2% body fat. Just huge. We called him Bubba, not to his face, but afterward when we talked about him. And Bubba didn't say a word. He just stood there and flexed. Oh, all of a sudden, my attitude was transformed. And I said to those guys, yeah, you better not let us catch you coming around here again. And then he said this, I was a different person because I had a great big Bubba. You know, the same thing holds for us. Look what it says here in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. These are the folks that were kind of afraid. They were, they were afraid of, of what might happen to them after Christ ascended into heaven and, and now they're left behind to face whatever is next. I mean, they were, they were praying, but they didn't know what to expect. And suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And just to remind you, the same word for spirit is the same word for wind in the Greek language. It's the same exact word. And so this is, is basically a, uh, a very real experience they had when the Spirit of God came and filled the house and they felt the wind. It was God reminding them of what was happening. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They had come from different parts of the world for the, this feast of Pentecost. And, and when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? Parthians, it's of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. So the Spirit of God was given to believers at this point. It's the first time the Spirit of God filled believers and formed the church on the earth. And, and the church, in essence, is a called-out assembly of God's people who the Holy Spirit indwells and lives among. And God sent His Spirit and you realize the very next thing, Peter, with great boldness, stood up and spoke to them, as, as we saw here. Well, Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit's work. What is that? Is he a temporary uh, thing, that, 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 uh, temporary presence in our life that, who, uh, who comes into our life, and then, and then if you don't do what uh, God wants, we'll leave you? And you have to worry about whether or not, whether or not you're truly going to spend eternity with him because you've messed up a few times, and oh, the Spirit of God has left me. See, that's what happened in the Old Testament. He would come in power. And in the case of Saul, you see a clear example of him withdrawing. Is that the case with us? Not if you understand 
especially these words of Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 3 he's speaking to Nicodemus who's wondering how do I enter the kingdom of God and Jesus said this in reply Jesus declared I tell you the truth no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again unless he begins a new life a new life that will not be taken away born again and Nicodemus was having a hard time understanding this in verse 8 we find a further explanation the wind blows wherever it pleases remember wind and spirit same word you hear it sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going in the same way so it is with everyone born of the spirit the Spirit of God enters your life and you begin to see a change just like the wind uh, affects the environment you can say well there's something there that I cannot see well you know what there's something in my life that nobody can see either except in my behavior except in my actions you see and so if you've been born again as according to Jesus words the Spirit of God has entered your life and changed you on the inside look at Titus uh, chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 as he explains or describes what happens in a human heart he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so how did he save us see at some point you understood what Jesus did for you you understood that that, that God uh, you were facing the judgment of God for your sin and it doesn't matter what you committed in, in the course of your life you can list them and people like to say well that's not a bad one that's, that's kind of a mild one and you know what maybe one of these days my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds and God won't see my sin as bad as it is you know what every sin is it's born out of an attitude that says I'll live my life how I please that's where sin comes from and it's the attitude that God wants to face there is something deeply wrong with the human race where people just want to leave God behind them and do whatever they feel like doing and leave him in leave him in uh, leave him directly behind their backs and every time someone makes a decision to do an independent thing apart from God saying you know what I feel like doing it this way I, I know God's Word says this or or uh, God would probably want me to do that but uh, I'm gonna do it this way anyhow it's always worked for me that's it it's an independent attitude that says I'll do it on my own and Jesus is God's gift to us who would take the judgment for all of that rebellion and that independent spirit that sin and he would be judged instead of us he would be punished instead of us and so at one point we turned to him and said thank you I need you I don't want to pay for sin on my own I know I won't spend eternity with God thank you for what you did for me I want that applied to my life Christ is alive now so you invite him to be a part of your life you put your faith in him you put your confidence in him and so at that point in time what does Titus 3 5 and 6 say the spirit of the living God <clears throat> enters your life and transforms you on the inside and makes you a different person than you were before he lives in you and has changed you 2 Corinthians 5.17 clearly says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. The new has come. You're a different creature. And that word creation is a different, different creature than you were before. You're born again. The Spirit of God has entered your life. 1 Corinthians 6.19-20 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And that's a plural. He's not only in you individually, but he's in you as his body of people upon this earth whom you receive from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You see, he's making a point here. Separate yourself from those things that the rest of the world thinks are cool and fun and all that stuff that God hates because the Spirit of God lives in you. You know, at VBS this past week, I was asked to do something with the kids that was interesting. <clears throat> I was, uh, there, there was a little tug-of-war room. You probably have became familiar with that where the kids were, uh, some kids were on one side of a rope and some kids were on the other side of the rope and, you know, kids would start pulling back and forth and sometimes it was an even match. And then I was the big guy uh, that was asked to come in and, and uh, grab, grab one end of the rope on one, uh, on one side of that rope. 
And so who was going to win? Well, the kids did because I don't have the guns. But anyhow, uh, no, they, they uh, you know, it was a no-brainer, right? The, the big guy, uh, you know, can pull him across the line. And I remember, I remember one little guy just curling up on the floor on the end that was losing one time. He just curled up on the floor. He just lay in there. And, uh, and uh, you know, something happened, you know? Did someone hurt you? You know, what's going on? What's going on? And he, he finally got up and he said, uh, why was he on their side? Right? What was he on? Well, the point of the thing is, is that when you trust Christ, you have a bubba. In your, you, have a, you have this huge, uh, huge, powerful person who's now resident in your life, who, who possesses power beyond our ability and gives us the ability to do things that we didn't have before. And uh, the third point is this. The Holy Spirit separates us to God from the rest of the world. What's the Spirit's... If you understand the nature of the word holy, uh, the, uh, understand the word holy, it literally means separate, okay? So God's considered holy to remind you. He's separate. He's different. He's pure. Everything that is different or other, he is. And so we come to him because, because he's the one that, that calls us to purity. And when the Holy Spirit of God enters our life, what does the spirit of holiness want to do in our life? separate us. He starts by separating us from the world and calling us his child. He starts by separating us from the world and giving us a new nature. Makes us completely different. And then he continues his work on, our, on, on us by separating us from the way this world thinks by continually appealing to us uh, uh, and, and sharing with us in our spirits that we need to be moving away from how everyone around us thinks about uh, whatever it is and moving in a direction that God calls us to, not only with our thoughts and philosophy, but with our behavior. The Holy Spirit begins to separate us. Will Rogers said, live so that you wouldn't be ashamed to sell the family parrot to the town gossip, gossip right? And so, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to be continually looking to God for the cues on how to live and, and not this world around us. How do you know what your behavior should be? How do you know? How does any of us know what our true behavior should be in this world? Well, look at uh, John 16, 13. And Jesus said, but when he... Notice what the Spirit of God is referred to as. The Spirit of truth. Not only is he holy, but he's called here the Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. How do you know it's true? Do we just make it up? Do we go along with what everyone else is going, hey, this is true, this is true, and inside you're going, I don't think so, but everyone is saying that that's true, so you go, okay, yeah, I'll go along with it. That's true. Or it comes from within. Oh, I really feel it, so it's true. That's not how truth enters our world. You see, the spirit of truth is the one who brings truth. That's why Peter wrote years later in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, what did the spirit of God do when he wanted to communicate to us how we should live and how we should view things? For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This word is inspired. There is certain information about God, certain uh, information about how we should be living our life that has been inspired, given to us from God by the Holy Spirit himself who says, I'm going to let you know what is true. And so we go to his words and we depend on these words as truth. And some people like to pick and choose. They like to go through God's word and say, well, that doesn't strike me as something that's cool for me right now. Uh, you know what? But this really makes me feel good that God's with me in whatever I want to do. So I'm going to hold on to that one. Listen, he refers to his word as a sword. And it cuts. And so when we want to know truth, it cuts how we feel a lot of times. You go, wait a minute. I don't feel like that, but that's what God's word says. So... I'm going to separate myself from the way everyone else thinks around me and the way that I feel like. I'm going to separate myself and I'm going to live the way God wants me to because the spirit of holiness has inspired this holy word that we can understand what's true in this world and then begin to live according to it. 
We can't conjure up truth on our own. That's why he said uh, n uh, that prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. Uh, the prophets didn't sit around and go, oh, man, I really feel that this is what God wants. It was the Spirit of God blowing with a hurricane force behind these people and brought his word and, uh, to pass for us to understand and read. He separates us to God from the world. Now, now, he empowers us to live the way that God wants. Take a look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Here's one of those clear passages in the Bible for, for believers to understand how God wants us to live. Behaviors are identified that are good and behaviors are identified that are bad. It's not an exhaustive list. But a concept is being brought across here. And he's saying this, so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Okay? Any believer in this room has the Spirit of God who has given them, made them born again, brand new. But guess what? You still have. You still have with you this old nature or what's called the flesh here. This way of doing and living that you always have been used to doing. And each one of us has a way, uh, has a way of pleasing ourselves and, and minimizing our pain and maximizing our pleasure in life. That's the pattern that we've learned all these years before we met Jesus. We knew how to, how, to, how to get by. We knew how to manipulate people. We know how to get pleasure. And we had a certain way of doing it. And each one of us in this room had a different pattern of doing that. Some like to numb ourselves. Some like to manipulate people in different ways. All these things. These are patterns of living that were felt right to us. But when the Spirit of God entered our life, he began to say, no, this is what you need to be doing. And so now we have a choice. Do we live according to the Spirit? Or do we live according to the old nature? Now, someone who's not a believer in Christ that does not have the Spirit of the living God in him or her, they only have one choice. They just keep obeying their, their flesh. They just keep doing what they've always done that's worked for them. And they don't think twice about what God wants until they have a, a, a crisis in their life at some point that gets them starting to think about God. But they just do whatever their flesh tells them. You as a believer have a choice. The Holy Spirit calls you in this direction, but your flesh calls you in this direction. Listen to what he says here. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. What does the sinful nature produce in your life? Well, let's read some of them. Sexual immorality. See, whenever someone wants to please themselves, do whatever they feel like doing in life, live according to their flesh, that's one of the things that pops at the top of Paul's list. They want to find, maximize their pleasure. Impurity and debauchery, different forms of immoral sexual behavior. And Jesus defined uh, the only container, the only container for sex in, our, in, in this world is what he designed as marriage. And he defined it between a, a, um, a male and a female because that's how he made them. That's the only expression of sex that God calls us to. Anything outside of that container, outside of the container of marriage, is immoral behavior, you see. And so that's at the top of the list. I find that at, you, find, you will find that in other places as well. Impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, pulling an end run around God to get what you want. Hatred, discord, jealousy, can't even get your human relationships right. It's always about me. Fits of rage, that's how people manipulate others a lot of times, getting what they want. Selfish ambition, notice the self, self, self. Dissensions, factions. How do dissensions and factions come about? Because people want what they want and they don't care about what other people want. And envy, there it is again. Drunkenness, orgies, just trying to please themselves. Trying to numb themselves, maximize their pleasure. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's all about them. It's all about the flesh. Uh, they, don't, they don't have uh, the spirit of God in them. They just continue to obey their flesh. They don't think twice that it's, it could be wrong. They say, man, this is cool. This is the way it should be. See, these are people that don't know God. 
And the Spirit of God has been given to us so that we don't live like that anymore. We live for God. And there's a process by which people evaluate their behavior and continue to be separate themselves from things that God hates. Wait a minute, that was the way I manipulated others. Wait a minute, I was a selfish fool back then. Wait a minute, I was just a pleasure monger back then. And they begin to start doing what God wants. And notice in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is in contrast, what does the Spirit of God produce in your life? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of holiness, wants to separate you and make you a different person as you live that out in this world, okay? Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 kind of give a, a highlight to this as the Apostle Paul is praying for the Ephesians. And what does he say? I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power, okay? Enable you to live the way God wants. How? Through his spirit in your inner being. You're a believer in Christ, the spirit of God lives in you. He wants to move through himself within you to do what? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Does that mean come in the first time? No. See, this word means to be at home in your house where you open up every room and say, you come in here, you come in here, you take a look down here, you get that, uh, that room cleaned up for me, Lord. I want you to have full access to my house. I want you to make my home, my house, my life yours. And I don't care what it takes. That's what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God does in our life. See? Separates us from the way the world thinks and behaves so that we live according to how God wants us to live and behave Fourth and finally, the Holy Spirit gives power to believers to speak about Jesus. He gives power to believers to speak about Jesus. As uncomfortable as that might be sometimes. Uh, let me read this to you. Uh, this came out of a, um, uh, the Atlantic in an article called Listening to Young Atheists, Lessons for a Stronger Christianity. The Christian scholar Larry Taunton launched a nationwide campaign to interview college students who belong to atheistic campus groups. Larry writes, Without fail, our former church-attending students expressed positive feelings for those Christians who unashamedly embraced biblical teaching. Michael, a political science major at Dartmouth, told us, and he quotes, I really can't consider a Christian a good moral person if he isn't trying to convert me. Christianity is something that if you really believed it, it would change your life and you would want to change the lives of others. And then he said this, I haven't seen too much of that. And what is it? That's boldness. To live according to your convictions not shrink back and be part of the rock wall that, that Peter was when he, when he had that epic failure. See? To, to speak out at the appropriate time. To, to share a conviction that you hold deeply. Man, you know, there's plenty of people that like to blow smoke and intimidate other people and they don't really have a lot of ground to stand on sometimes, but sometimes Christians don't know that. And just boldness is what people need. And well, why should we be bold? Why should we be bold when it comes to Jesus? And, and using the appropriate time to share something. I'm not talking about just being obnoxious, right? I'm talking about appropriately sharing a conviction about Christ in the appropriate time. Why should we? I mean, look at Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Uh, this is after Peter and John were released. They came back. And the believers are going, what happened, what happened? They prayed. They talked to God. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And notice what the words are here. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. 
filled with the Spirit and boldness. Someone who's filled with the Spirit doesn't just have Jesus living in them. Someone who's filled with the Spirit is someone who wants to align themselves with what he wants to do and say, I want to live for you. I want to follow you and I want to take cues from you and what guess what the cues are? Talk about him to other people. Why? And Jesus said something very powerful, very powerful in a couple of sentences in John chapter 8 that we should all take heart, take to heart. In verse 23, he said, you are from below, I'm from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Here's the sentence. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Repeats it twice. There's a penalty for people who do not have their sin forgiven, have never looked to Christ as the one who could forgive them, and have never embraced him. Jesus called it dying in their sin, which means they will pay the price for their sin when they face the judgment of God. You see, right now, when we put our faith in Jesus, we trust that the Father has judged Jesus instead of us. The judgment has already fallen on Christ for us. We're not going to face it. But for someone who doesn't know Jesus, they reject him, and then they fi suddenly find themselves standing before his judgment seat. Guess who the judgment is going to fall on for their sin? Not on Christ. It will fall on them because they foolishly thought they could show up and their good deeds will outweigh their bads or whatever, they'll work off their karma, whatever it is. They'll come into the presence of the Holy One and they will be judged for their sin. And then eternal death is what happens next. Not eternal life for those that trusted that Jesus was judged for their sin. For people who trusted themselves in this life. And why, what did Peter say uh, with great boldness to the Jewish rulers? Just to remind you of one last thing here. Who, re, uh, who uh, uh, just had recently facilitated the death of Christ. What did he say with great boldness to him? You know, uh, uh, surely you're a Galilean. Uh, uh, you know, uh, surely you were with him because you're, you're, you're from Galilee. No, 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 no. I don't know the man. Here's the same person in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No other name in heaven. He's the only one. Let me close with this. I found this. There's a man by the name of Ken Elzinga who uh, is uh, on staff at the University of Virginia. He's been a professor for years there. I mean, he's an outspoken Christian. He, they call him in for special events uh, Christians do and he'll, he'll speak very intelligently on the faith. And I'll read this to you. At age 26, Ken Elzinga joined the faculty of the University of, of Virginia. He's only 26 years old at this time. And after a tenured colleague warned him that being explicit about his faith would hinder his career, Elzinga was stunned to see a flyer with his face on it placed in a prominent campus location. A campus ministry had posted it to advertise a talk he had agreed to give. So he agreed to give a talk to a, uh, uh, to a group of Christians on campus. And they said, hey, Ken Elzinga is going to be speaking here. Put his face on a poster that would be posted in public. A relatively new believer, Elzinga worried. Would fellow professors think less of him? Might this harm his tenure chances? He experienced a dark night of the soul, returning to campus and secretly taking the poster down. But the next morning, Elzinga put the poster back up. After hours of soul searching, he concluded that his life was not about career ambition but about faithful discipleship and that being private about his faith was not an option. In the four decades since, Elzinga has been named Professor of the Year multiple times and is still a speaker in high demand. He will be the first to say that serving only one master has been liberating. Why? Because pleasing an audience of one makes us less anxious 
less sensitive to criticism, and more courageous. Because in doing so, we become more secure and complete and compete less for our honor. Boldness. Boldness. And, and I guess uh, as uh, we consider, contemplate maybe the boldness that Peter had after the Spirit of God entered his life, after he felt empowered to speak to those folks, he took the opportunity to do it. The difference was the Spirit of the living God in him. And anyone here who would choose to be filled with the Spirit, live according to the Spirit of God, it's going to, at some point, result in you speaking up for him. It will, at some point, in, result in that. Someone cannot be filled with the Spirit as a believer in Christ and not speak up for him at some point. And you know those opportunities. We've all had them. Uh, where the, the time is just ripe for a word to come out of your mouth about Christ. Maybe a friend that you've had for years that uh, uh, you haven't really made clear the message of the gospel. Uh, there's a time to do that. There's a time to speak up. And folks who are living according to the Spirit are empowered to do that and will do that when the time comes. Lord, we come to you. And we are grateful that we can know you. And we're grateful that you've given us a reason to live on this earth. Not just to serve ourselves, not just to get whatever we can get and then die, but to be your witnesses. Just as you told us would happen when the Holy Spirit came, we would be your witnesses and around the world, basically. And Father, I ask that each one of us here would take those opportunities that maybe even some have on their mind something that uh, maybe recently has come up or they're thinking of somebody uh, that uh, might possibly uh, be uh, someone they would speak to the next time the opportunity arises or maybe even take that opportunity to do that. I ask that each one would experience your power, your ability in a new way, knowing that you, Holy Spirit of God, dwell in us who believe we want to be witnesses to Christ. My Father, I ask... Uh, for anyone here who has not put their faith in Jesus yet, still considering what you would have them do, maybe resisting, but they haven't yet received you, I ask that you would do that work in their heart that would break down those barriers that would convince them of things that are true and convince them of those sins in their life, the sin that they have that needs to be forgiven.